Welcome back to Chapter 14 of my Farmloom Engage LTC run. This is one of the most involved chapters in the game. It features the most required bosses of any map so far, and one of them has three health bars. While each boss is relatively weak, the larger number of total health bars requires many actions on our end to clear them all out in two turns. That said though, at this point we basically have four bosses of our own. Ivy will rescue Citrine across the moat, and the two of them will be the Dire Thunder duo in this map. Partly to overcome a high doubling threshold on the Swordmaster, but more so because they need to be able to kill their targets from three spaces away. Alongside them, Kagetsu will fly across the moat and farm some Parthia kills. A common strategy is to use Bonnet Shield here to protect a few units holding a 3 tile choke point, but we're just going to rely on dodging instead. That sounds kinda sketchy, but we have multiple high avoid and graves at this point, and Ivy's bulk is also good enough to take a few hits. Understood. Lastly, Pandora flies up and rescues his sister, using Alir's body to rescue boost her off a tile and enabling her to initiate Great Aether in the boss room. Now, just clearing out the bosses doesn't take too many staves, but this map has one important side objective. The boots. We skipped these last time we were here, but since then, a couple of turn saves have been discovered that require obtaining them and, surprise, giving them to Ivy. We will dedicate about half the team to acquiring it within the two turn clear. Like with chapters 11 and 13, we are going to perform a staff chain to get Amber all the way to the top right room on turn 1. Such a chain requires at least one staffer to have access to Canter, as they will move up two spaces and allow another staffer to borrow their warp staff and perform the second warp. The third warp is performed by a warper that is warped over the moat themselves, which in this case is Lapis. Finally, Amber rewarps himself into the room, totaling four warps and one rewarp to get there. Unlike in Chapter 13, incorporating a rescue into the staff chain is much harder because there's a moat in the way and we have a low number of flying staffers. This enemy phase has a few small chances of failure dispersed throughout. Alir must dodge a 22 hit rate from this longbow archer, as her getting hit would cause enemies to prefer targeting her over Ivy for a higher chance to kill. In principle she can just dodge all those enemies as well, but we definitely want them to suicide into Ivy instead if possible. Ivy's survival rate here is mostly fine, with the one caveat being that she is exposed to low percent crit rates. A crit from the Javelin or Steel Ants would be pretty bad, as she would then need to dodge the other two Cavaliers to survive. A crit from the Killer Lance is not as problematic, because the Killer Lance doesn't do much damage to begin with. She would still need to dodge at least one of the other two hits though. Lapis is also exposed to a small crit chance here. The space below her is obstructed by Alir to avoid the possibility of the Wyvern targeting her instead and blocking Lapis's path. This chapter features a grandiose usage of Great Aether. With the high might of the Silver Great Axe, Panette is able to one-shot all five enemies around her simultaneously, knocking a health bar from each of Sephia and Mavir. Ike gives her sufficient bulk to survive, and the delayed attack of Great Aether nullifies Hortensia's fracture. This is sadly the only time in the run where Panette does something like this, but regardless it's a really cool strat that's become sort of a standard affair in LTC clears of this chapter. Conveniently, the three hounds have linked AI, causing Marnie to unknowingly move into Ivy's attack range without any targets of her own, just because Zephy and Mavir moved first. Ivy still has a tome equipped, which causes the train to activate spell harmony. This allows her to exactly one around either Mavir or Zephyr with chain attack assistance from Panent. So because of this extremely specific situation, Spell Harmony is better than Chaos Style. Citrine then canters down one space, creating another opportunity for a rescue boost. After Lapis rescues Vander, Penrera will move right in between Ivy, Penet, and Citrine, and then rescue Kagetsu. All spaces around Penrera are occupied except for up, so that's where Kagetsu goes, giving him just enough movement to reach Hortensia and take her first health bar with Parthia. Doing so causes reinforcements to spawn around her, but they don't act early enough on enemy phase for that to matter. Amber then grabs the boots before I forget about it later. This roll can be done by virtually anyone, he's just a unit I remember to give a staff rank to before chapter 10. Afterwards, Panette will one-shot Zephyr's second health bar, and in the process will facilitate a third rescue boost. Vander moves up to rescue Alir forward, and because Panette and Pedro occupy the spaces around him, the game sends Alir up, giving her enough movement to take out one of Hortensia's health bars as well. This is one of the last combat contributions that Alir makes in this run. 
She needs a crit, which sucks, but there's a couple opportunities to manipulate Aran's here if needed. Hortensia's final health bar is taken by Astrostorm, which is performed by Meryn mostly because she has solid base strength and doesn't require too demanding of a forge. Amber can also do this in principle, if he wasn't busy grabbing the boots. Other units like Jade can also work if they inherit momentum beforehand. If Alir failed to crit, then Meryn could do this first and Alir can try to take her third health bar instead. Failing at that, Diamant also has a chance to attack a straggler to burn more RNs. I sort of messed up here though. He should be able to survive two attacks without dodging. Finally, Marnie suicides into Ivy on enemy face for some reason. Marnie has a Hurricane Axe equipped, dealing effective damage to flyers. Odds are that she sees the highest kill chance on Ivy, ignoring the fact that it's a smash weapon so Ivy attacks first, killing her and ending the map in two turns. 